It's Liz Gaines with GigaOM here with Brett Taylor, the new CTO of Facebook, just named that a couple days ago. Um, so I think we're going to start off by asking, what, what is your new role? Congratulations on that. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Um, it's still a little undefined. The role was just created for me a couple days ago, so it's still kind of a work in progress. But uh, at Facebook, I've been focused on the platform, which is an interesting product because the technology that uh, sort of powers the platform and the product itself are very intertwined. Um, you, know, you can't really talk about one without the other. So I think I'm gonna be focusing on other products at Facebook like that initially, things like search and newsfeed where the technology and the product are sort of uh, closely tied together. Can you tell us a little bit about what you worked on at the company so far, given you, you joined about a year ago when your company Friendfreed was acquired? Yeah. Um, so I've primarily worked on the Facebook platform and our efforts to date have been um, really about uh, re-architecting the platform from the ground up with a focus on simplicity and stability and speed. Um, we aren't really completely there yet, but uh, the products that we launched at F8, I think sort of captured the spirit of that simplicity. And when we say simplicity, it's really the ability to, you know, from the moment you decide you want to start integrating with Facebook to actually deploying a product, cutting down that time by, you know, an order of magnitude. Um, I've also done a little bit of work on some more back-end infrastructure at Facebook that isn't really visible uh, to, as a product to end users, but it's something that's you know, becoming more widely used internally here at Facebook. What's that? Uh, it's, it's uh, I guess, a little esoteric. So uh, it's, it's, uh, internally, we store a lot of our data in a graph structure, meaning uh, objects like the users and pages and events at Facebook and the connections in between them. So, when you say you're attending an event that's stored as a connection in the social graph, or if you're tagged in a photo, that's a connection from you to that photo. And uh, one of the pieces of infrastructure I've worked on is a, uh, a, a tool that engineers use internally to query those connections in a very efficient manner. And how has the um, adoption been of the uh, open graph and other things that you launched at F8? I mean, you know, it's been really tremendous. Uh, in particular, we launched sort of uh, two main products uh, at, um, at F8. One was social plugins, which are these cut and paste uh, pieces of social functionality you can put on your site that with just a line of HTML can add social functionality to your site. And over 100,000 sites have implemented those. And um, the people who have implemented social plugins have seen a, a really great increase in traffic from Facebook. Um, I personally am really excited about it because it turns out that when you're like developing a newspaper site, you're not really developing a social network. You know, the, the types of things you think about when you're developing a social, like a newspaper site are about content management, you know? And so with uh, our platform prior to F8, when people were trying to socially enable their site, it was a huge engineering effort. And it involved sort of re-architecting their entire site to make it work to say, show what are your friends reading. Right, um, so people never got around to it. People never got around to it. I mean, especially since they weren't sure what the benefits would be. You know, mm -hmm. would they actually see an increase in engagement if they did that? And, you know, there's been lots of sort of false promises from technology companies about, you know, increasing engagement on content sites. And the neat thing about social plugins is, you know, because it's so easy to do, a huge number of content sites in particular deployed this and actually saw, you know, a really big improvement in engagement. And I personally really like it because there are sites that I, I liked, like WashingtonPost.com, um, where my interests aren't necessarily the editorial staff's interests. So, you know, Washington Post is very focused on politics just by virtue of the fact it's in Washington. And now when I visit WashingtonPost.com front page, they have a social plugin that has what my friends recently liked, which sort of highlights some of the technology stories that may have been sort of buried in the technology section of the paper. Um, so to me, Washington Post has become a much more personally relevant place for me to visit. Um, and I think that sort of really kind of illustrates the vision that we're trying to go for, which is everywhere you go, you should have a personalized experience. You should see your friends' profile pictures with the things that they've been doing and um, sort of complementing the editorial voice of, of a paper like that. Can you tell me a little bit about, I know this takes uh, stepping out a second, but how you think you're perceived at Facebook and what your role is within the company? How I'm personally perceived at Facebook? Um, <laughs> well, that is an interesting question. That's, uh, you might want to ask other people about that. Uh, I, I think my, um, one of the things that I've personally been very passionate about is simplicity. And that means a lot of different things. But in particular, both uh, our internal platforms and our external platforms, having it something that 
is not only powerful, you know, not only you know, generates a lot of distribution and engagement for sites, but it's also something that's elegant and beautiful. Um, and I think uh, that's something that I've been sort of like both in our internal platforms and external platforms very focused on. So I assume people might associate me with that. Um, maybe it's a little annoying. I just go around trying to like cut features rather than add them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I'm, I'm personally very passionate about. I think it, it's very important because as a platform grows in scope, um, it's very easy for it to become so large and intimidating that new developers are sort of unwilling to invest the time to invest in it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we think about our broader vision for Facebook, which is, you know, you, you bring sort of your friends with you everywhere mm -hmm. and you have a genuine personal social experience everywhere you visit, we need to make a platform that's broadly applicable and like ubiquitous. And to do that, I think it needs to be something that is comprehensible to every new developer and every new site that, that comes across it. And then likewise, internally, when we think about engineering productivity, every new engineer you add and every thousand lines of code you write, you know, increases the, the scope and complexity of a new engineer joining the company, coming in and becoming productive. And so I think it's interesting because I think there's a lot of parallels in, in the two, both our internal systems and our external. And that's something that I've been very personally passionate about and it's probably associated with me internally. What about how um, Facebook is perceived externally and specifically with developers? I mean, you came in as a developer on Facebook and sounded like your frustrations led to a lot of the products that you've championed internally. But um, how do you think that's changed? Um, how do you think that people feel about the recent launches that you've made? Um, so I think we've gotten very good feedback from uh, a lot of web developers who had been looking at a lot of our um, a lot of like competing social platforms and troubled by the complexity of Facebook's platform. Um, and, and in particular, uh, the ability to kind of dip your toe into Facebook with things like social plugins without having to do a huge investment is a really distinct change. Um, we, when we launched Facebook platform, it was a, a really all about building applications within Facebook. So you were really sort of betting the farm on Facebook. You know, your entire application live within the Facebook Chrome. And, you know, for a lot of site owners, you know, they had their own identity and their own brand off of Facebook. And, you know, building a separate application that lived in this own separate Facebook world was just an, something a lot of developers were unwilling to invest in. Right. Um, so I think we've gotten a lot of positive feedback there. Um, we have done a lot of changes to the platform, so um, on, the, on the sort of flip side, some of the things I think we need to work on is some developers have, who have spent a lot of time developing their applications within Facebook are saying, right. hey, what about us? Are right. you still committed to this? And we are. I think we were just trying to make our platform more broadly applicable to external websites, but over the next few months, we're going to be you know, investing a lot in, uh, particularly games are a huge part of the Facebook experience and powered it exclusively from external developers. And we're going to be doing a lot of work to improving gaming on Facebook and, you know, really reinvesting in that area of our platform. What would that entail? Um, well, it's interesting. I, um, Facebook is so many things to so, to every user views Facebook in a different way. I mean, if you ask one, some people, what is Facebook? They'll say, oh, it's a place to share photos. And then if you ask another user, they'll say, oh, it's a place to play Farmville. And if you ask another user, it's, you know, a place to share links. And so if you look at the Facebook homepage, it's very interesting because we're optimizing for all of these different types of users and all of these different types of applications that live within Facebook. So we're choosing between someone got a new job, someone posted baby photos, and someone reached a new level in Bejeweled Blitz. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have to compare those apples and oranges and decide you know, what are we going to show you in that top you know, 600 pixels of your homepage. And it's a really challenging problem, but as a consequence of it being such a challenging problem, we've really um, dialed down the distribution channels on Facebook for a lot of our application developers so that, you know, uh, Bejeweled Blitz didn't overtake the baby photos. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've done it in a way that was uh, probably a little too coarse grained. And so I think we, we need to develop systems internally that um, are a little more thoughtful and subtle in the way we deal with it and understand, hey, well, for this person, they're really into that, that application, mm -hmm. whereas their friend might not be. So we're going to like, you know, treat those two users differently in our system. And I think we're still trying to figure out exactly what that system looks like, but that's the sort of the crux of the problems that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm.